Thanks for joining us today for our low pressure sewer overview webinar. Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Kelly. I'm an application engineer at Zoller, and we appreciate you joining us for our low pressure sewer overview webinar. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few details. First, please note the email address written at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any questions after we wrap up, you can send them to webinars at zoller.com and we will get back to you. Now that those details are out of the way, I want to start off by telling you a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Michael Kelly. I've been working as Zoller's application engineer since February of 2018. I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of Kentucky. I graduated from Western Kentucky University with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Master's in Business Administration. At Zoller, I primarily work with customers, reps, and engineers with design and technical issues and applications, including low pressure sewer, pump sizing, basin sizing, on-site wastewater treatment, and other specialty applications as needed. But now that you know a little bit more about me and my background, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna be talking about low pressure sewer systems, and this is gonna be just a general overview of them. A lot of the topics that we talk about here today could be a webinar of their own, but hopefully no matter where you are and your low pressure sewer knowledge, this will be beneficial to you. So we'll start off by talking about the topics that will be covered today. First, we're gonna start with just a general definition of what low pressure sewer is. How do we define it? You know, what is this LPS that everyone's talking about? We're gonna talk about the benefactors, those are the people who use these systems, who benefit from these systems. For you sales guys on this webinar, these are gonna be the people you're talking to and calling on about these systems. Pressure sewer versus gravity sewer. Why would we use pressure sewer over the tried and true gravity sewer? We'll talk a little bit about the differences between step pressure sewer, septic tank effluent pump pressure sewer, as well as grinder pressure sewer. We'll discuss the unlock components and the system components on lot being the components that exist on the homeowner's property or if it's a commercial property on that privately owned property system components are is really the collection system that brings everything together at the end we'll discuss briefly who owns and maintains these systems and with a brief discussion as well on the hydraulic design and how we select our pumps and pipe diameters and so on and so forth so what is pressure sewer? It's also commonly referred to as low pressure sewer, LPS. So low pressure sewer is an alternative collection system. So gravity being the primary collection system used in wastewater, this is an alternative to that gravity system. It's comprised of small diameter pipe with a pump at each service connection. So at each individual home or at each commercial building, and sometimes you can cluster a few buildings together into one pump station, but generally there's a pump at every service connection. And all those pumps together create pressure to convey that waste to a point of treatment or to another existing collection system, whether that be an existing gravity sewer, a larger municipal type lift station, or some other existing pressure sewer. So this is just another method to move water from a location to a collection system or a treatment system further down the line. So when we talk about who use these systems, first and foremost is municipalities. So many, many years ago, 30, 40 years ago, they may not have had the infrastructure to bring on the residential developments and the commercial developments just outside of city limits. And as such, those developers likely put in septic systems, on-site wastewater systems, and after years have passed, decades have passed, many of those septic systems have began to fail. And as a way to extend their customer base and correct the environmental hazard that that presents, a lot of times they'll convert those older septic subdivisions to a pressure sewer system. It also allows them to extend their customer base. Maybe they're just looking to you know, be a bit more proactive on those septic systems before they fail, or the land that previously wasn't developable is now developable. Uh, maybe it has a difficult site condition and pressure sewer increases the feasibility of development for those difficult sites. 
Another big advantage for developers and as well as municipalities is that many times pressure sewer can be a low cost alternative to gravity. And then I throw in civil and environmental engineers because they're generally the ones that design the system. They're many times the decision makers on how the system is designed and what material and what pumps and you know what miscellaneous components are used for these systems. So I'll throw them in there as well too. Because understanding pressure sewer is another tool in their tool belt to satisfy their customers in designing a wastewater selection system. So whenever we compare pressure sewer versus gravity, uh, sometimes it's easier to highlight where gravity maybe isn't the best option or the, the limitations of gravity and how pressure sewer can overcome those. First and foremost is elevation. So with gravity sewer, unfortunately, it only flows downhill. It does not flow uphill. So adding pumps into the system no longer constrains us by gravity. The combined pressure of all these pumps push water to higher elevation so we can overcome those lower lying sites and pump that water up to a higher collection system. Difficult site conditions is another limitation for gravity. So rock, rolling topography, water tables limit the feasibility of gravity. Alternatively, pressure sewer mains follow the topography, eliminating the need for deep, costly excavation. So to put in a gravity sewer in rolling hills is going to likely cost either excessive grading or excessively deep trenching, which becomes very costly and potentially dangerous with the, the ability for trenches to collapse on workers installing them. Pressure sewer alternatively can follow the topography. It only needs to stay at or below the frost level. So here in the state of Kentucky, our frost level is around 30 inches. So as long as our pipe remains 30 inches below grade, then it's fine. We don't have to worry about cutting through hills or running very deep excavations. Another thing is it can be also minimally invasive. Pressure sewer can use installation methods known as horizontal directional drilling, which allows for a minimally invasive installation in areas with existing infrastructure. So we talked about those septic conversions. Those are existing neighborhoods. There's roads, there's streets, there's utilities running through that area. So to put in a gravity sewer, you're going to, have to disrupt a lot of that. You're going to, have to tear up streets, you're going to, have to tear up yards, you're possibly going to, have to move utilities around which is very invasive and very costly. Alternatively, with horizontal directional drilling, you can dig two holes on each end of where you wanna run a pipe, and you can drill that pipe underneath the ground without having to disturb that area. So it makes it not only less expensive, but also more efficient without disrupting those existing homeowners or business owners that are in that area. Inflow and infiltration. This is a big one for gravity sewers. It's a big problem in gravity sewers. Gravity systems are designed to leak. A tolerance is always given to inflow and infiltration when designing a gravity collection system. Another issue, if water can get in, that means water can also get out in many cases, known as exfiltration. So you can see here, I got a picture on the right. You may be wondering what that picture is. The people, down in Florida and the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast is probably familiar with this. This is the red tide. The red tide is very harmful to the environment. It disrupts tourism and the economy down there. And one of the major contributors to the red tide is the old sewer systems. The sewer gets out into the water and becomes an environmental concern. So another issue with gravity sewer. Alternatively, pressure sewer systems are sealed systems, and before they can be put into service, they have to be hydrostatic tested to ensure they are watertight. So no water can exit, also no water can enter. So not only does it eliminate exfiltration, it also eliminates infiltration. Now I will say that pressure sewer systems are not completely rid of INI, it's still possible. Careful attention should be taken during installation on the non-pressurized components such as the tanks and basins or the septic tanks if you're using a step system because if water inflow and infiltration could get into that tank where that pump is housed that pump will then force that rainwater into the system so it's good to make sure that people aren't illegally discharging their sumps or their roof drains into their sewer system rising sea levels is another one so 
as the sea levels rise, the water tables also rise. And if a gravity system becomes submerged beneath the water table, then that I and I becomes much worse. Alternatively, with pressure sewer systems, even if that water table rises up around that pressure sewer system, again, it's sealed and it's hydrostatic tested. That water cannot get in. So even if those sea levels continue to rise, that pressure sewer system should remain in service without additional I and I. So the last one here is sustainability. This was one that whenever I first started getting into the pressure sewer industry, I was scratching my head. How could be putting an individual pump station in every connection be more sustainable than a gravity sewer? It shows itself mostly if you're having to use a lift station where sewer is exceptionally more sustainable than a gravity system is if you're using, say, a larger municipal lift station to service that development. And the reason for that is, is all of that infrastructure has to be in place before the first home can be built and sold. So if you think of a delayed build out or a long-term build out, you may have a six or seven figure lift station that's only being paid by a couple of homeowners. It may be 10 years before you see that full build out and that full capacity that's needed for that lift station. So for those 10 years, you're only getting $30 a month per connection. And if you've only got a handful of people paying to sustain a seven figure lift station, then that's not a very sustainable business model. So alternatively, pressure sewer systems are built out as needed. Already the upfront cost is generally less because we're installing smaller diameter pipes, two, three, maybe even four inch diameter pipes. Whereas with gravity systems, you have larger, usually minimum eight inch pipe with the addition of manholes and deeper excavations. So you save a lot of money upfront in that instance, but also you're, you're not really putting in those pump stations until those homes are brought online or until those homes are built. So it's a delayed outlay of capital, saving uh, the developer and the municipalities money upfront on these types of systems. So now we're gonna get into a discussion about effluent sewer, and then we'll get into a discussion about grinder sewers. We're not really gonna do much of a side-by-side -side comparison, but I will talk about some of the advantages and maybe the disadvantages of those two. And starting off with effluent sewer, one of the primary advantages is the solids, fats, oils, and greases are retained on site. And the advantage of that is those solids, fats, oils, and greases do not end up in the collection system or at the treatment plant. Since we are just pumping water, we can also use smaller, more economical pump packages. Generally for most residential and even commercial applications, all we need is a small half horsepower pump. And system maintenance, since we're also only pumping water, is generally less. Now, whenever I say system maintenance, I'm talking about the primary collection system, including air valves and the force main itself. Grease is notorious for plugging up air valves as solids can settle and cause plugging or clogging in these systems. So if we're only pumping water, we've removed those solids, we've removed that grease, we've removed that chance for those air valves to plug or the line itself to plug. You should still have air valves, you should still have a maintenance protocol, but generally the emergency maintenance visits are generally less for effluent sewer. Also, since we're just pumping water, scouring velocities are now less critical. So for your lower flow or seasonal applications where they may shut down for a few months out of the year, maybe you've got some snowbirds or you've got the other issue where people are leaving during the winter or coming during the winter and gone the other half of the year. In those times, you've got relatively low flows. We can't ensure that that system is going to be routinely scoured. And for grinder sewers, many times we would have the municipality or whoever maintains that system flush those at the start of the season. Not necessarily an issue with effluent sewer. And then the last one, and probably the biggest advantage of effluent sewer, is that it allows for decentralized and more efficient centralized treatment. So a septic tank, which is required for step systems, can treat waste back to approximately 50% of clean drinking water. So raw wastewater being 100% dirty or 0% clean, however you want to look at that, a septic tank will get it halfway back to drinking water levels. That significant drop in waste drinks and removal of solids allows for more efficient and economical treatment options, especially for those decentralized systems. So when I say decentralized, these are more rural developments generally away from where municipal treatment is available. 
you can use much more economical, lower maintenance treatment options to treat effluent versus treating raw wastewater and especially ground up raw wastewater. And additionally, even for the municipality, if you've got a municipality that's kind of at their limits or near their limits, they may be a bit more selective on what they're willing to take on as far as additional waste flow to the plant. But if you're using a step system and that waste strength has been cut in half, they're generally more likely to take on those customers because many times it can allow them to avoid capital investments to increase their capacity at their treatment plants. Now with step systems, it does require a septic tank. So this is probably the primary drawback just because it's a larger footprint. It's a little bit more unsightly, if you will. And those septic tanks do require pump outs. So it's recommended every three to five years that you pump out your septic tank. Some can go longer, some may be less, depending on use and abuse as with anything. So we really got two different types of pumps when we're talking about step systems. We've got turbine pumps, which is essentially a well pump that has been adapted to the effluent environment. These pumps can produce very high pressures at relatively consistent or low flow. So for an average residential application, we've got a, a nominal flow rate of 11 gallons per minute, and that pump can produce up to 500 feet of shutoff head with a one horsepower motor. Typically, we're only, again, using half horsepower pumps, but that just goes to show the pressures that these pumps can produce. They're great for residential and commercial applications. So we've got the 11 gallon per minute is standard for residential, but we've got higher flow pumps that are available for commercial applications as well. They are serviceable. So there's three distinct sections, which we'll see on the next slide. The motor and the wet end can both be easily separated and replaced in the field. The primary drawback of the turbine pump is the minimal solids capacity. So these can pass around an eighth inch solid. So even though we're pumping primarily liquid, many jurisdictions require an absolute minimum, even in step applications, to be able to pass a half inch solid. So if that's the case for your particular area, we're probably going to, have to go over to the low head centrifugal. And the low head centrifugal is probably what you would typically imagine a submersible effluent pump. They produce higher flows, but relatively lower pressures. Average flow rate for these pumps is 30 to 50 gallons per minute. Shutoff heads range from 70 to 130 feet. They're great for residential and commercial. Again, we've got those higher flow options for those commercial applications. They have the larger solids capacity. So if you do have to meet a minimum solids capacity requirement, these pumps can likely meet that. The drawback for these is the limited head you know, only producing 70 to 130 feet in the serviceability. These generally, if you have a failure, it's generally replacing the pump entirely with the exception of like a few minor repairs. And another thing, no matter which pump you use, filters should always be used for all step applications, whether it's a pressure sewer or just you're pumping up to some sort of on-site distribution method. You should always use filters whenever you're pumping effluent. So to kind of give you a visual representation of these two pumps, on the left, you've got the turbine pumps. If you've seen a well pump, you've seen a turbine pump. They're essentially the same thing. The screenings and I think the cordage is a little bit different, so that's adaptable to the effluent environment. On the bottom half here, you've got the motor. The screen section in the middle is the intake, and then the top side is the wet end or the pump end. On the right, you've got what would be typical of a low head centrifugal pump. Again, likely what you think of or visualize when you think of a submersible pump. The only thing that's really notable about the effluent pumps is you see there's no float switches built into this. So it doesn't have that little lever coming out with the float on the side. That's because in effluent applications, you always wanna use non-automatic pumps with the off point above that pump. You wanna keep these pumps fully submerged because there is a higher concentration of hydrogen sulfide gas in effluent environments which can corrode those cast iron pieces and components. Now these turbine pumps are all non-corrodable, so you can expose these to some degree, though there is a minimum liquid level that you have to maintain above this intake. This is a cutaway of the, the top half of a turbine pump, just kind of give you an idea of how they can reach those extremely high pressures. Down here, you've got the intake, the motor would be below this. And then in hot, inside here, you have multiple impellers stacked on top of each other. This allows you to maintain a consistent flow rate, but hit very high pressures. 
This is what a typical installation would look like with a step vault or a septic tank effluent pump vault. This is a two compartment tank. This compartment here on the left is going to be your primary settling tank where you settle out your solids, your fats, your oils, and your greases. And then on the second compartment here is where you'll have your effluent. That effluent will flow into this vault through a filter bank, again, retaining any solids that may have potentially made it this far down the system. And then that pump will pump that water on out to the collection system. Some jurisdictions may require a second pump tank. So this is, again, one of the drawbacks of effluent systems, especially if you have to have a separate pump tank. This gets a much larger footprint. You've got several risers now, which is again kind of an eyesore for some homeowners but you've got the sludge layer here at the bottom the scum layer here at the top this is your primary settling tank again you want to use filter so in this case we've just got a filter on the outlet t and then over here you've got your filtered effluent with the pump that then pumps this water on out to the collection system so that kind of wraps up the discussion on effluent sewer now we're going to move into grinder sewer so grinder pumps are designed to grind the solids into a fine slurry and pass those solids. So now we have solids in our collection system. So there's just a few more things that we have to consider when we're sizing these systems. Now, compared to other sewage pumps, ground sewage is easier to pump than raw sewage. So that allows grinder pumps to produce those higher heads much higher than a typical solids handling pump. So whenever we're doing pressure sewer systems, we won't ever really recommend that you use a solids handling pump because solids handling pumps have relatively low head capacities and a significant fluctuation of flow rate. So generally we're gonna stick with grinder pumps for raw wastewater pressure sewer systems. Now, one of the primary advantages of a grinder system over say a typical step system is the small footprint. Typical residential applications require just a 24 inch diameter basin. I generally recommend a 30 inch for a simplex system. It just allows a little more room in the field to work on and service these stations as needed. Also gives you a little bit more capacity. You get a few more gallons per inch out of a 30 inch versus a 24. They are serviceable. So grinder pumps, particularly the progressing cavity pumps are serviceable. However, they are naturally more expensive than step pumps, and therefore they cost more to replace. So in the event that you do have to replace this pump, grinder pumps are generally more expensive when compared to step pumps. Now, since we're pumping full raw wastewater, you're gonna have higher strength waste with grinder sewers, but for municipalities, that's generally not a major issue. You know, besides the one example I gave earlier where they may be at their capacity already, but generally it's gonna be higher strength waste, Municipal treatment systems can usually handle that just fine, but for your decentralized systems, added care and attention should be taken on what treatment solutions you're providing for that system. Also, since the solids, fats, oils, and greases are pumped into the collection system, scouring velocities become more critical and require an analysis to ensure proper pipe diameters. Now, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't do an analysis for your step systems because you should. But for grinder sewer, it becomes a bit more critical. So again, same with step systems, we've really got two types of pumps that we generally propose for grinder pressure sewer systems, one being the progressing cavity and one being a typical centrifugal grinder pump. So the advantages of the progressing cavity is it can produce very high pressures and relatively consistent output. Again, an average flow rate of 11 gallons per minute, they can pump up to 240 feet of head, which is a little over 100 PSI of pressure out of these pumps. They're great for residential. They are not ideal for commercial. Some manufacturers recommend putting multiple pumps into a station to hit those higher flow rates. I alternatively would push you towards a centrifugal because we can hit those higher flows and those higher demands with a single centrifugal pump versus multiple progressing cavity pumps. They spin at 1750 RPM, and generally I'm not overly concerned with the speed of a pump, but whenever you're talking about grinders, that cutting mechanism spins at the same speed as the pump. So 1750, we put a lot of thought into our cutting design. However, 1750 just doesn't cut as well as 3450. Now the progressing cavity again for your typical waste, residential waste will do just fine, but the centrifugal pump will do just a little bit better. 
They are limited in their scouring capabilities. So with raw wastewater, we have to be concerned with scouring velocities. And due to the lower flow nature of progressing cavity, that becomes a bit more of a concern. We need to take a, a closer look at the design. Rotor and stator design. So we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. That's gonna be the primary differentiating factor of how this pump is different than really probably any other pump that you're familiar with. For centrifugal pumps, they produce higher flows but lower pressures. So for your commercial applications and residential as well, we can hit those higher demands. We don't have to store up that water and pump it down over time. We don't have to rely on multiple pumps to pump down that water. We can get flow rates of an average around 35 to 55 gallon per minute out of two horsepower and less. The primary drawback though in this case is the limited head of about 100 to 125 feet. They're great for residential and commercial, so we can get those higher flow rates. We don't have to put in oversized basins or multiple pumps. We still generally recommend duplex for commercial applications, but that's because we want 100% redundancy. We're not putting that in there so that we can hit those higher flow rates. They spin at 3450 RPM, so you're gonna get a little bit better cutting action. The higher flow rates give you better scouring, but again, the primary drawback is gonna be that limited head. I've got a note here about NSF 46. So whenever you're selecting pumps for a pressure sewer system, it's best to have a pump with an NSF 46 rating. That test that you have to go through to get that rating includes a negative head test. And those pumps are able to pump against that negative head without any immediate failure or even shortening the life of that pump. The reason for that is we think about pressure sewer, we think about these really high pressures, but in reality, depending on where that pump is located within that system, it's likely that at some point it's either going to experience very low heads, if not negative heads. That's very, very possible in pressure sewer system. And I would say the majority of the pressure sewer systems that I've seen have sections within that system that may have negative heads at some point throughout the day. So you always want to kind of select a pump that can operate for that full range of pressures. So to kind of differentiate the main differences between these two pumps. So from the, the top two sections being the cap and the motor housing are relatively the same. So you got the cap with starting capacitors through all terminals as needed. You've got the motor cavity between these two pumps are relatively the same. Slightly different motors between these two particular models I've got here. But where they really begin to differentiate themselves is on the volume of this pump. Cutting mechanism is relatively the same between the two. The only difference for the centrifugal pumps is we have a reversing option, meaning that every time this pump cycles on, it reverses direction. So cycle one, it'll go in the clockwise direction. Cycle two, it'll go in the counterclockwise direction. So that's really the only main difference from a cutting perspective between these two, and of course, the speed at which they cut. But how they move that water is different. So most people are likely familiar with the centrifugal type. You've got an impeller that spins and creates centripetal force within this volume and then forces that water up out of the discharge. For the progressing cavity, it's a little bit different because we have this rotor stator, which is comprised of a rubber boot you see here. Ours is made of an EPDM material, very commonly used in the wastewater industry and acceptable for pumping wastewater. And then we've also got this corkscrew shaped rotor. So this rotor sits down inside of the stator. They have some opposing geometry. As this corkscrew shaped rotor spins, it will create small pockets or cavities between the rubber and the metal. And as it spins, it will progress those cavities upwards. That's how this pump gets its name, progressing cavity. The primary issue or drawback of these is you cannot run these dry. If they run dry, you could melt the rubber and reduce the efficiency, if not completely eliminate the ability for this pump to move water. Or if you have any gritty material, it may wear these surfaces out a little bit sooner. Now, gritty material and running pumps dry is also bad for centrifugal pumps. They're just a little bit more resilient. So that's why I generally lean to centrifugal pumps if the head allows it in the design. That's generally what I'm going to recommend. Though again, if it's residential application, we've just got some higher pressures or the city has a preference towards progressing cavity, I have no reservations of using progressing cavity pumps in that application. 
So the basins, so rather than using a large septic tank, we can get away with a much smaller footprint. So here on the left is our poly basins. This is gonna be our standard offering for simplex packages. So residential and light commercial. These are made of a high density polyethylene. The standard size is 30 inches diameter by 72 inches tall. We've also got additional risers that you can put on these pumps, 12 inch and 26 inch riser, which allows you basically to push that basin a little bit deeper to get deeper discharge depths to meet frost depth levels or to intercept deeper inlets. The two primary options you have are our Flexos discharge shown here. This has our RWD pump, which is our progressing cavity pump. It's got the floats built into the cap with a redundant on alarm float as well as a single on off float. You have a disconnect here at the top, so all you need to do is pop that off and you can pull this pump with this rope up and out of the basin for service as needed. You get all the floats and controls, everything all pulls out at once, including the discharge assembly. Alternatively, you can also get these with a rail system. If you've ever seen a larger commercial or municipal station, it's very common to have a rail system in those applications. Not as common in the smaller residential and light commercial, though we do have that option available where you've got these guide rails here to lift this pump up out of the basin and also to guide that pump back into the basin. And these pumps will seat under their own weight and seal, give you a watertight seal as well. And you've got a float tree here on the left side for your off, on, and high water too. On the right side, you could also do fiberglass. So fiberglass is fully customizable. You can get these pre-built at the factory. You just drop them in the hole, plumb them up, run electricity to it, and it's ready to go. So it's a complete ready to go system. You can get them in simplex or duplex. Both of these show rail systems. You can also get flex hose options with the fiberglass. You can get these as small as 24 inches diameter up to as large as you want and also as deep as you want. So if you have a really deep installation, we may go fiberglass or you want a larger basin for those commercial applications or you want duplex, we can do that with fiberglass basins as well. And that's gonna come complete with the basin, the plumbing, the rails, the discharge assemblies, uh, the lid, you can get fiberglass lids or aluminum steel lids with hatches whatever you prefer, completely customizable for fiberglass. Now we're gonna transition into more of these system components. What we talked about with the effluent sewer and the grinder sewer was pretty much all on lot components. Now we're gonna get into the common pieces of the entire system. And the curb stop fittingly is kind of that separation point. Curb stops should be used in every installation. Curb stops that we recommend and that we have You've got a check valve and a shutoff valve all kind of in one component here. You will have a check valve inside of your basin as well, but this check valve is essentially a redundant check valve and it protects your system from backflow. This check valve is always resisting any backflow. It also resists air. So air is very common within pressure sewer systems and air can cause problems. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But if we can keep air out of our individual stations, that's also beneficial. And that check valve will help do that. Also, you've got the shutoff valve. These will be installed with a riser shown here in this sketch. You can close this system off. So if you know you need to get into this station, you need to do some service, and you just wanted that added peace of mind, you can completely isolate the system with the shutoff valve. Many times, we'll talk a little bit about ownership later on, but if the municipality is only owning the collection system and say the homeowner or a third party service contract is maintaining the system, this curb stop is many times at separation point where the homeowner will own everything here to the left, including their lateral service connection and the basin pumps and controls itself. The municipality will own everything downstream, which is the primary collection system. So whenever we talk about controls, we need a way to turn these pumps on and off. I generally recommend people to stay away from just a piggyback float to turn these pumps on and off. Controls just kind of give you a little bit more adjustability, a little bit more added features, and especially you'll get some added features with our pivot panels. Typical installation for residential applications is going to be simplex. This panel shown here is a duplex. Residential applications usually looking at simplex. Commercial applications generally duplex. Uh, some affluent neighborhoods may have all duplex, they produce higher flows, they want that added redundancy. But generally, 
simplex with an off, on, and high water flow. The standard pivot panels offer many standard features that you will not find on other typical relay mechanical panels, such as a touch safe user interface, smart switch technology, which allows this control panel to maintain operation even with a failed float. You also get additional alarms such as high water, continuous run, incorrect voltage, disabled alarm circuit, a failed contactor, overload, float faults, and even an HOA timeout. So a lot of additional features in our standard offering. The next step up would be our Pivot Pro series. As you can see, it looks a little bit different. The primary difference is that LCD screen from a visual perspective. It has all the same features of the Pivot panel, but that LCD gives you added field configuration data, allows you to troubleshoot the system a little bit better. And probably the, the greatest addition in this panel is it has the data jack for our remote monitoring cloud system, Z Control. We'll talk about that a little bit here in a second. For the RWD specific pump, so I talked about this a little bit earlier. This is our pump that has the on off and the redundant high water floats built into the cap. So that just has one singular cord coming out of it. It's a six wire cord. And we've got this panel here that was specifically designed for that pump. So we've got it in two options. We've got it just the standard offering, which is the 0001 panel. And the panel here at the top, it's a little bit larger because it has a generator receptacle with an automatic transfer switch built in. So if you're in an area where you're worried about extended power outages, you've got that generator receptacle there to be used as needed. And additionally, these RWD specific panels are also capable of connecting to our Z Control cloud monitoring system. Uh, this is just a very brief discussion on this, just scratching the surface. So be sure to check out Zoller's YouTube channel for more info on our pivot panels and our control options available. Just go to YouTube, type Zoller in the search bar, and you'll be able to find our page and subscribe so you can get all of our future videos as well. So to, again, to just touch briefly on Z-Control, cloud connectivity for remote monitoring. Our IT team built our own cloud. We did not rely on a third party company to do that for us. The advantage of that is we control those costs and we don't need to pass those costs on to our customers. So our customers get free standard access to the Z control cloud monitoring system where you can get email, text and push notifications on your smartphone. The app is available in the app store and Google play. So iPhones and Android phones can download our app. We've also got a web based account that you can access. So you can check it from your computer as well. And in there, you can check statuses, you can check alarms, you can check your history and so on and so forth. Again, just scratching the surface here, we've got a lot of past webinars and other videos available on our YouTube page if you really want to dive into the specifics of this. So we're going to talk a little bit about pipe selection. So again, we're focusing here on the system aspect. So pipe should have a minimum operating pressure of 160 PSI. We're putting in a lot of pumps onto these systems and those pumps can collectively drive up pressures relatively high. So we wanna make sure that we have a safety margin built in that collection system. So generally minimum operating pressure of 160 PSI. The three most typical pipe selections that I see are high density polyethylene, DR11, PVC SDR21 and PVC schedule 40. Schedule 40 is probably the least common here in the States, though it, for whatever reason, it's used very commonly in small on-site or effluent systems. It's also very common in Latin America and Mexico as well. A lot of the deciding factors on which pipe to use comes down to availability, and that sometimes can be localized as what you can get more easily. PVC SDR21 is more common with centrifugal systems. It has a larger internal diameter, which reduces the friction losses. So again, we're limited on our heads with our centrifugal pump. So that slightly larger pipe allows us to reduce the pressures on that pump and get more flow. We're not necessarily worried about that scouring that larger pipe because those centrifugal pumps produce much higher flow rates. Alternatively, if you're using progressing cavity systems, I would recommend the high density polyethylene DR11. Slightly smaller diameter. That means the progressing cavity pumps can scour that pipe more easily, 
And another big advantage of high density polyethylene is it's great for directional boring. You can get pipes of really long coils of pipe, you know, a couple hundred feet even. Alternatively with PVC SDR21 and PVC Schedule 40, those come in sticks of pipe. So installation can be a little bit quicker and easier when we're using high density polyethylene. Now again, to touch back on the on-lot components. So whenever I say laterals, I'm talking about the service connection between the homeowner's pump and the common main. For effluent systems, it's typical to see one inch or even inch and a quarter laterals. For progressing cavity systems, I would always recommend inch and a quarter. I wouldn't go any smaller, I wouldn't go any larger. If you go larger, you run the risk of not being able to scour that pipe. If you go smaller, it's, there's really just no need to go smaller. For centrifugal systems, the discharge on most all of our centrifugal pumps that we would be using in a pressure sewer system is inch and a quarter. So that's where I would start. Uh, that's generally what I recommend, though you very commonly see inch and a half or maybe even two inch for maybe those commercial connections. So if that's the case, you can get a two inch discharge with our basins, or you can just put a reducer to go from one and a quarter to inch and a half or two inch as needed. So let's talk about clean outs. So we haven't talked about this, about the physical layout of a pressure sewer system just yet. We've got a we've got a picture on the next slide that'll help explain this a little bit better, but pressure sewer systems are generally laid out in a dendritic fashion, like the branches of a tree. You've got a primary trunk line that's gonna be at the outfall where all this wastewater ends up. And then out from there, you've got branches that terminate. Those branches go out to side streets or to cul-de-sacs and they terminate at a final point. These are not looped systems typical to say like a water distribution system. The reason why these have terminating points is because we want to control the direction of flow. We want to ensure that all the flow is moving in one direction, which allows us to ensure our design will better scour those pipes. For that reason though, we need to put flushing connections at these terminal points. So if for whatever reason we're having localized high pressures or nuisance alarms, it's possible that some solids have settled in that section of pipe. So you've got these flushing connections to come out and clean out those sections as needed. Additionally, for relatively longer running pipes, because you can only flush a connection so far, you should have inline flush connections. Generally, these are installed every thousand to 1500 feet. A lot of times local regulators will set what that distance is, so be sure to check with them. But these are just a flushing connection, again, just to clean out those longer runs of pipe in between clean out stations. This picture here is kind of just a typical pressure sewer system that we helped on. This was a decentralized system, so they were treating this wastewater on site. This was the treatment plant here. This was the outfall. So this is where all this waste is being pumped to. And you can see this pipe layout section kind of goes out to the far reaches and terminates. So your terminal cleanouts should go at all terminal points, highlighted by the blue dots here. Additionally, you should use them at intersections. So anytime where you have two or more pipes coming together at a common point, you wanna have clean outs there to continue that flushing further down the line. Also, any significant change in direction. So really anything over a 45 should have one. You can see here the two green dots, those are 90 degrees or more. So I'd recommend putting a flushing connection there as well. Inline clean outs, again, every thousand to 1500 feet, there's only two pipe segments in this application that exceeded that 1,000 to 1,500 feet, which is in the top left and the bottom right here. And they weren't quite 2,000 feet, so I just recommend them putting a clean out, kind of split the difference there and put it right in the middle. Critical locations are also another place to consider putting clean outs. So any areas that are difficult to access, any low points that may be passing through a valley or a ravine, Underneath a river, you should maybe consider putting clean outs there to easily service those areas or major road crossings. You don't need to put one on each side of say a residential street, but if you're crossing a major interstate or a highway, it's good to put a clean out on either side of that so you can very easily flush out that section as needed without having to disrupt the traffic to do so. Air release valves. So air will find its way into collection systems. Air release valves are critical on individual stations. They're even more critical in pressure sewer systems because trapped air reduces system efficiency. Whenever I first started, I just envisioned that air would push out with the water. It would just go out like a log, long slug, 
and it would bubble at the end and clear out that air by itself. That's not the case. Air will collect at the high points, and rather than just pushing out, if anything, they will just elongate. But that air will stay inside of that system, and that air pocket essentially creates a constriction. That air is essentially pinching off the cross-sectional area of that pipe. And in extreme cases, it can actually deadhead pumps. It can significantly reduce the efficiency. Because if you're constricting the flow area, you're increasing the pressures. When you increase the pressures, re you reduce the flow rate of pumps. So it can cause nuisance high water alarms or sewer backing up in the event that that pump can no longer keep up with the water coming in. So air valves should always be put at all high points. And preceding a drop in elevation of 25 feet or more or any significant change in slope. That 25 feet is actually a very generous number. I would really say five or 10 feet, you should have an air valve, but any defined high point should have that. Even if you have a flat run of pipe, you should still have these every 2000 feet. And if you're less than 2000 feet, I would still maybe recommend one kind of somewhere in between. And whenever you're installing these systems, you may in instruct the contractor to create kind of like a false high point and raise the pipe up just slightly in one area. That way that air can easily collect in one location and be released to atmosphere. Because the same as with a high point, the air will just collect on the crown of the pipe. And as it continues to collect, it will continue to pinch off flow. So air valves are critical. You should use combination air and vacuum valves. So just as it is important to release air. It is also important to allow air back in for siphon prevention. So again, we talked about the possibility for negative pressures to exist within pressure sewer systems. We want to prevent siphons if at all possible. In extreme cases, it can damage pipe, it can collapse pipe, but it can also suck pitch dry, which is never good. It could suck solids in that aren't ground up properly. For step applications, you never want to suck your septic tank completely dry with the exception of, you know, say a, a scheduled pump out. So you want to prevent siphons if at all possible. We have added valves in our pump stations to prevent siphons there, but if we can eliminate them in the collection system, that's the best place to do so. This is what a typical installation would be. This is kind of an offset installation. You can also install these directly above the pipe. You just want to tap into the crown of that pipe where that air is going to collect. That air will flow up through that pipe into this valve. So the valve is a bit elongated and it operates with a float. Inside of there, there's a float. So if it's full of air, that float will drop out. That water will come in and push that air up out of the valve. As the water continues to rise within that valve, that float will rise with it and seal off that orifice. In the event of a siphon, that water will exit that valve, allowing that float to drop and allow air to come in as needed as well. So always, always use combination air and vacuum valves at your high points in your system. This is a very exaggerated example, but you can see this is a very clearly defined high point. So they have correctly called out a proposed combination air and vacuum air release valve here. This kind of gives you a good idea of how pressure sewer systems can just follow the topography here. They're maintaining a four foot burial depth here, but they're just following the topography. Alternatively, if you're going to go with gravity, you would have to cut through this hill to maintain a proper slope, or even worse, you'd have to put a, a lift station here to get up and over this hill as needed. So who's gonna own and who's gonna maintain these systems? Again, it really breaks down to two different sections. You've got the collection system itself. This is the common main that everyone is tying into. And then you've got the individual on-lot components. Ideally, the municipality will own both. The municipality just has a little bit better service, a little bit better O&M typically. They're usually better geared for this service. But for the collection system, I would for sure have an overarching service provider over the whole system. One common entity, whether that be a municipality, a sewer authority, or a third party service contract, or even an HOA. I've seen HOAs be responsible for as well. Whenever it comes to the on lot component, sometimes municipalities do not want to take on that added O&M and that overhead to maintain the individual pump stations at each home. If they don't, the next best option, again, is still an overarching service provider, whether it be a sewer authority, a homeowners association, or a third party service contract. So I include the reps here, because many of our manufacturing reps also have a service arm 
or they can at least put you in contact with someone who's familiar with this type of service. It's best to have that overarching service contract rather than leaving it to the homeowner. These systems are specific engineered systems. And if you don't understand that, if you're just looking at the single lift station at the home, you don't understand the intricacies of this entire system. So a lot of times if it's left up to the homeowner, my fear is always that they'll get an alarm or they'll have some sort of pump failure and they'll call their cousin who was a plumbing apprentice for six months before he became a car salesman. And they come out, they try to work on it. And you know, there's several things that could go wrong there. One, in the instance of a progressing cavity, if they're not familiar with that type of pump, and they test it outside of the basement and run it dry, that could be very damaging to the pump. Or two, they just don't understand that that pump was very specifically selected and they go and grab a solids handling pump. They say, well, let's get rid of this grinder. Let's put in a solids handling pump. That's always my concern with leaving it up to the homeowner that the proper service and the proper maintenance isn't getting taken care of. So I always recommend some sort of overarching maintenance contract who understands the entire design. So now we're gonna transition into the hydraulics. How do we size these systems? There's really two options for a typical residential and light commercial pressure sewer system, how to size these. There's the probability method and the rationale method. If you've ever heard anything about pressure sewer, it's very likely you've heard of the probability method. It's less likely that you've heard of the rationale method. The probability method is only applicable to progressing cavity pumps. That's where it's most commonly misapplied is people use them for a centrifugal system. It's really only applicable for uh, progressing cavity pumps and progressing cavity systems. The reason primarily for that is progressing cavity pumps were first applied to pressure sewer back in the 60s. Since this was new technology at the time, they did a few small installations and they studied those installations. From those studies, a statistical analysis was done to determine the probable number of pumps expected to operate simultaneously given the total number of pumps connected to that system. So for example, if there are 15 pumps connected to a pipe segment or to a, an entire system, it is expected that four pumps will operate simultaneously at some peak event. So if we know there's four pumps operating simultaneously, they produce an average flow rate of 11 gallons per minute that gives a design flow of 44 gallons per minute. Now that we know our flow rate, we can calculate our friction losses, we can add in our elevations, that gives us our total dynamic head. And with that information, we can properly select pumps and equipment as needed. The primary issue with the probability method is that is it intended for PC systems only and is also less adaptable to design requirements. For example, if there are a few commercial properties sprinkled into a residential pressure sewer system, it is difficult to account for the higher flow from that commercial property because it just assumes that there's one additional pump there. And depending on how that falls on the scale, the anticipated number of pumps to operate simultaneously, it may or may not impact that hydraulic design at all. Even if you're putting in multiple pump systems, you can maybe design it as two pumps, but even still, that may not have any influence on the hydraulic design. Alternatively, there's the rationale method. So, as stated by the EPA, is the preferred and simplified method for analyzing pressure sewer systems. It is acceptable for both centrifugal and progressing cavity systems and is adaptable to design requirements. The flow rate is determined by an equation. That equation is Q equals AN plus B, where A is typically 0.5, N is the number of EDUs, and B is 20. EDU stands for equivalent dwelling unit. So if I have 100 homes, that equation would be 0 0.5 times 100 plus 20, which would be 70 gallons per minute. That would be my design flow for 100 homes. It's also more adaptable. So if we want to account for higher flow, say from a commercial connection, I can convert the daily flow rate of that commercial connection to EDUs. So for example, commercial building that produces 1,000 gallons per day, would be equivalent to four or five EDUs. So essentially what I can do is I can model that commercial connection as if it were four homes in one spot. So I can influence that design. I can also adjust the A value or the B value as needed. If I have all commercial connections, maybe rather than adjusting the number of EDUs, I adjust the flow per connection, which is what A represents. 
So it's a bit more adaptable as long as you understand what those adaptions are that you are making. Now, if all of that has your head spinning and you don't know what we just talked about, the good news is, is we can do that for you. In order for us to do that for you, we need some information. First and foremost, we need just some project information, a project reference. Where is it located? Who is the engineer? Do you have an engineer? You should have an engineer. Drawings of that system. And in that drawings, we want preferably a force main layout provided. We can rough one in for you. It's not going to be construction grade drawings, but we can rough one in to kind of get the analysis done. Elevations need to be included as well. Generally, we prefer an AutoCAD drawing. So we can work with PDFs. It's just more difficult and cumbersome to do so. And that's going to delay the turnaround time on these analyses. So if you can get us a CAD drawing with the force main layout and the contours in there or the grading elevations, whichever one, that is very much preferred. The design method. So does this need to be designed to the probability method or the rationale method? Now, again, generally, if you couldn't tell with the way I talked about the two, I lean towards the rational method. Since the probability method was the first on the scene, it was adopted early on and the rationale method came later. So um, despite all the information that's available now, many municipalities, many jurisdictions still uh, use the probability method to design their systems. And it's good to know that up front so I don't do the analysis on the rationale method just to say, hey, can you redo this based on the probability method? Discharge location and type. So are we pumping to an existing gravity system? Are we pumping to a municipal lift station? Or are we tying into an existing pressure sewer system? If we're tying into a pressure sewer system, we need to know what the pressure is at the tie-in point. Because in that case, we have to not only overcome the pressure within our system that we're designing, but we also have to overcome the pressure at that discharge point. So we kind of need to understand exactly where we're pumping this water to. The daily flow rate per connection, if it's all residential, that's usually pretty easy. You could just assign a daily flow rate per a home. If you've got commercial applications, it's good to get the daily flow for each one of those. Again, if they're all very similar, you can maybe just give an average flow rate for all of them, but it's good to know what the flow rates are of the buildings that would be served by this pressure sewer system. Pipe type or preferences. So we talked a little bit about the different pipe types. You know, what does your contractor prefer? What does your engineer prefer? Or what's most available, maybe? And C value. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the C value correlates to the roughness of a pipe. It's what's used in the Hayes and Williams equation when you're calculating friction loss. For plastic pipes, it's generally recommended that you use a C value of 140 to 150. However, the 10 state standards, which many regulating authorities adhere to, requires a C value of 120. For plastic pipe, that is very conservative, but they generally stick to it. And I've tried to fight that fight with very little success. So again, it's good to know that information up front. And then at the end, just any special requirements. That's kind of an open, open box, if you will. Just if there's anything specific about this installation that you feel is worthwhile for us to, for us to know, just let us know. This is kind of a printout of a typical analysis. This represents just one branch of a force main. So there could be multiple branches in your design. And in that case, you'll get multiple pages that look like this for each branch. But you've got various rows here. And each one of these represent a different pipe segment. You can see how many pumps were added in that segment. What's the cumulative number of pumps, including the pumps that were added to that segment, plus the upstream pumps contributing flow to this pipe segment. That allows us to calculate the design flow. You've got some other information pertaining to that pipe segment. And all the way over here to the right, you've got your total dynamic head. And again, from this value, we can select a pump. So in this case, our model 7010 was the go-to pump. That's kind of my standard you know, residential grade centrifugal grinder pump. It's a two horsepower pump, works very well. But again, we talk about pressure sewer being really, really high pressures, but even in this one, you can see the peak pressure is only 38 feet. So don't think of pressure sewer as being a tremendous amount of pressure. In some cases it is. We have some pressure sewer systems that exceed 100, 150, but also to kind of represent that, that pressure, you've got this graph down here at the bottom. This blue line here is the pipe elevation. So this is kind of a rough profile of that force main. This red line represents the hydraulic grade line 
So you can kind of see how the friction loss builds within the system and the vertical separation between these two give you your total dynamic head at that point. So we could quickly see this is gonna be the highest pressure in the system. because This is the greatest vertical distance, which correlates to this 38 feet. It also kind of gives you an idea of where you may need some air valves. So here at the back of the system, even though it's at the very back, you still wanna put an air valve here. You also have somewhat of a defined high point here. You can see there's a significant drop here. So again, this is kind of a rough profile. If this has a significant drop, let's say it really comes out to here, then drops off. You may want an air valve here as well. You may want one here too. So again, just a rough estimate but it kind of begins to give you an idea and that allows the engineer to dive in more deeply as they refine their pipe layout elevations. So this concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. I hope you found the information valuable. And if you enjoy our webinars, we want to be sure you know we also offer in-person training and live virtual training sessions at our Zoller University on-campus location. So the Center for Excellence. The center is a 6,000 square foot facility with a classroom area for lectures, in a demo room for hands-on learning. Our CFE staff can tailor courses for anyone, whether you're a beginner or a more seasoned professional. And if you can't come to us, we can come to you with our Zoller University on the road product trailer. The trailer is stocked with our latest products, demos, swag, and more. So you can reach out to your lo local Zoller representative to schedule a visit from the Zoller product trailer or to get you into the CFE. Should you think you might have any lingering questions, again, please jot down our webinars email and send them our way. So that's webinars at zoller.com. And with that, we'll wrap things up. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. Have a great rest of your day.